Hi, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Landforms. This is a lab manual in Unit 5. Section 1, A Changing Planet, Old Man of the Mountain. Sometime between midnight and 2 in the morning on May 3rd, 2003, a rock formation in the White Mountains of New Hampshire collapsed to the ground. This wasn't just any rock formation, though. It was named the Old Man of the Mountain because it looked like the profile of a face sticking out from the mountain. The Old Man of the Mountain was famous. The profile has been New Hampshire State Emblem. It also appears on state license plates, state road signs, stamps, and on the back of New Hampshire State Headquarters. When the old man of the mountain collapsed, people left flowers at the base of the cliff in tribute. The processes that created the old man of the mountain began roughly 200 million years ago. The same processes that formed it are the processes that caused it to collapse. Earth's materials. Understanding what caused the creation and collapse of the old man of the mountain begins with an understanding of the materials that make up Earth's surface. Earth is a rocky planet. A rock is a mixture of minerals that heat and pressure have pressed together. Minerals are inorganic solids that form naturally from elements and compounds. About 70% of Earth's surface is covered with water. The remaining 30% is covered by the continents. However, beneath the water and the layer of soil, sand, and plants is a rocky layer called Earth's crust. The study of Earth's materials, as well as the processes that have shaped the planet is called geology. The primary focus for geologists is the geosphere and how the other systems interact with it. Remember that the geosphere is the Earth system that is made up of Earth's solid materials, including its interior and surface features, such as landforms, including mountains, valleys, rocks, and soil. Weathering and erosion. The geosphere doesn't remain the same. Earth's surface has been changing since Earth first formed 4.6 billion years ago, and it continues to change today. The rocks that geologists look at today are made of the same matter that existed when Earth first formed billions of years ago. Energy, both from the sun and Earth's interior, work to constantly reshape and reform all of the rocks on the planet. We'll explore the changes caused by energy in Earth's interior in the next section. All rocks on Earth's surface are constantly shaped by two processes, weathering and erosion. Weathering is the breakdown of rock into smaller pieces from exposure to wind, water, changes in temperature, and or biological forces. You may have a difficult time imagining something solid like rocks wearing down over time, but everything does. If you take a look in the lint trap of your dryer, you will see that your clothes are being worn away as they tumble in the dryer. A dryer weathers your clothes. Pebbles on the beach are worn smooth by the action of waves and water. Weathering is the result of interactions among all of Earth's systems. For example, remember that when water falls to Earth's surface as rain, it is slightly acidic because it carries some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This slightly acidic water causes chemical weathering of the rocks on Earth's surface. Chemical weathering occurs when chemical reactions break down the bonds holding the rocks together. The chemical weathering breaks down the rocks, transforming the matter into new substances with different properties, including salt and other minerals. This is the process that causes salt and other substances to end up in the oceans, making salt water. It is an interaction between the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the geosphere Chemical weathering generally occurs gradually over time. Wind and water also cause mechanical weathering. Mechanical weathering takes place when rocks are torn apart by physical forces without any change in their chemical nature. In other words, the rock is physically broken down into smaller fragments, all of which keep the same properties as the original rock. 
The constant freezing and thawing of water in the water cycle is one of the most common types of mechanical weathering. During the cold months, the water expands into ice when it freezes. The expansion of the ice puts force on the rock and weathers it by deepening cracks. This is an interaction between the geosphere and the hydrosphere. Tree roots and insects can also cause mechanical weathering, making their way into rocks and causing them to slowly crumble away. These are interactions between the geosphere and the biosphere. Gravity is the third source of mechanical weathering. The weight from heavier rocks and the pull of gravity puts pressure on rocks, causing them to crack. Both mechanical and chemical weathering cause rocks to be broken down into sediment. That sediment is then transported by wind, water, or gravity to new locations in a process called erosion. Weathering and erosion are different processes, but they often occur at the same time. For example, water running downhill in the water cycle is the primary cause of weathering and erosion on Earth. As water travels, it constantly rubs against soil and rocks. The friction eventually weathers these surfaces so that tiny pieces of dirt and minerals get swept into the current of moving water. Effects of weathering and erosion. Weathering and erosion have shaped many of the landforms on Earth today. The destructive side of erosion carved out on Earth's valleys and canyons, while the deposits created the wetlands and river deltas. Weathering and erosion are also responsible for the creation and collapse of the old man of the mountain. The old man of the mountain was created millions of years ago by weathering and erosion caused by the powerful movement of glaciers. A glacier is a flowing mass of ice and snow that forms on mountaintops and near the North and South Poles. Glaciers weather and erode Earth's materials as they move over them. Weathered earth materials become frozen to the bottom of the glacier and get carried along with it. Those pieces of sediment get dragged over the land, weathering the land in the same way that sandpaper wears down and smooths objects. As glaciers erode earth materials, they carve out the land between them. These processes are what cause the rock formation in New Hampshire to appear to be the profile of a face. Over the millions of years since the old man of the mountain was created, weathering and erosion continued to work on the rocks, gradually weakening the structure. This constant wearing away and eroding eventually caused the rock formation to collapse in 2003. As the old man of the mountain demonstrates, weathering and erosion can take place quickly or slowly. Flash floods, avalanches, and mudslides may break down and move rock quickly. Beach erosion is caused as waves that constantly hit the land carry sand away with them out to sea. Slow erosion creates some of Earth's deeper landforms. Rivers, streams, and gravity may slowly carve down the land around them over millions of years. For example, scientists believe the Grand Canyon was primarily shaped by erosion caused by the movement of the Colorado River over millions of years. Protecting land from erosion. Erosion is an important process in shaping Earth's surface. The planet would look dramatically different if erosion didn't happen, without many of the dramatic and various landforms that make up the surface. Dunes are a good example of a common landform created by erosion. Dunes are common along beaches and they form when wind blows sand into one place. The wind erodes the sand, carrying it from one place to another place. Over time, many pieces of sand collect in the new place, creating the hills of sand. However, erosion can be destructive to people's way of life. For example, erosion along the coast can threaten homes and other structures that people depend on. Erosion can also affect people who live on or near hillsides. In response, people have come up with various ways to protect their property. Many coastal towns use concrete walls to block waves from eroding the shoreline. Others use more natural solutions, such as planting native march plants, because the roots and stems are sometimes enough to break the wave energy 
and trap sediment so it doesn't wash away. Plants are also useful on hillsides because the roots anchor the soil or sand in place. This makes it harder for wind and water to erode the soil. Section two, Earth's interior, collecting rocks. For his job, Dr. Randy Keller has traveled to every continent on the planet, including Antarctica, where he would camp out for two months at a time. He has taken a research vehicle and descended into the deep, dark ocean. From the darkness, he saw brightly lit organisms swim past his window. He has also traveled to Hawaii, where he saw lava flow down a hillside and then cool into solid rock in front of his eyes. Dr. Keller is a geologist who studies volcanic rocks to learn more about Earth's structure. A volcano is a structure formed around a hole in Earth's crust that releases magma, which is molten, semi-solid rock. When magma reaches Earth's surface, it is called lava. Dr. Keller studies volcanic rock to answer several questions. How old is the volcano? How deep within Earth's interior did the lava come from? How did the lava interact with on its way? I'm sorry, what did the lava interact with on its way to the surface? One of the challenges to studying geology is that many changes on Earth happened a long time ago. Another challenge is that the deepest any machine has drilled into the planet is 12 kilometers, nowhere near the center. Most of what we know about the inside of our planet comes from scientists who study volcanic rock, earthquakes, and meteorites. Studying Earth's structure. Geologists like Dr. Keller can tell a lot about Earth's history and its interior by studying the rocks that make up the planet. This is because the matter that makes up Earth's interior doesn't always stay deep within the planet. Let's begin with the different layers that make up Earth. If you sliced Earth in half, you would see four layers based on the density of each layer. The inner core is Earth's hottest layer. It is made up of a mixture of solid iron and nickel metal. It is surrounded by an outer core that is made up of a less dense mixture of liquid iron and nickel metal. Surrounding the inner and outer core is the mantle, which is mostly magma, molten semi-solid rock. The mantle makes up almost two thirds of the Earth's mass, around 83%, and is about 2,900 kilometers or 1,802 miles thick. Earth's crust is the hard rock layer of the planet that makes up the continents and holds the oceans. The crust is Earth's thinnest and coolest layer. The crust is part of Earth's outermost 100 kilometers called the lithosphere. The lithosphere also includes the part of the upper mantle, where the rocks are cooler and stronger than the rest of the mantle. The lithosphere is broken into slabs of solid rock called tectonic plates, and they are constantly moving and interacting to create many of the landforms of the planet. The places where Earth's tectonic plates meet are called fault lines. The lithosphere floats in many pieces on a zone of weak, melted rock called the asthenosphere. The plates move because the mantle is in constant motion. Because of Earth's structure, heat is continuously flowing from Earth's center outward. Remember that heat is energy that is transferred whenever two substances are at different temperatures, and it always flows from faster moving atoms, a higher temperature, to slower moving atoms, a cooler temperature, until both substances reach the same temperature. Heat from Earth's core forms the lower part of the mantle through conduction, heat transfer that occurs when molecules collide. When molecules of the mantle near the core are heated, their particles move faster. As the particles move faster, they become more spread out and less dense than the cooler upper mantle rocks, whose particles are much slower. The cooler particles clump together, becoming denser. The warmer rocks rise while the cooler rocks sink creating slow currents within the mantle. This motion describes a form of heat transfer called convection. 
Convection is the same process that powers deep ocean currents and winds. Interactions of tectonic plates. As the tectonic plates move, they change Earth's surface and materials in different ways. Tectonic plates move extremely slowly, no more than a few centimeters a year, although the different plates move at varying speeds and in different directions. Scientists continue to study the complex behaviors of the plates, which sometimes crash together, pull apart, or sideswipe each other. When two plates move away from each other, perpendicular to the fault line, they form a divergent boundary. This creates ocean bridges and rift valleys and may result in earthquakes and magma swelling, swelling up into the surface. When two plates move towards one another perpendicular to the fault line, they form a convergent boundary. When two plates converge on each other, sometimes one of the plates sinks under another plate. This is called subduction, the process that occurs when two plates crash into each other and the edge of the heavier plate slides beneath the lighter one. The heavier crust melts back into the Earth's mantle, becoming magma. As it melts, some of it returns to the surface as volcanoes and lava flows, creating volcanic mountain ranges. When two continental plates converge on one another, neither is subducted because both plates are relatively light. Instead, the force is so powerful that the land is uplifted and mountain ranges form. Sometimes plates slide past one another. This happens as transform plate boundaries, and it results in the plates grinding along their sides as they go. As they rub against each other, there is a tremendous amount of friction. Earthquakes may occur at these plate boundaries. There are various pieces of evidence to support the idea that Earth's tectonic plates have moved, changing Earth's surface. One piece of evidence is the shape of the continents. A continent is a main landmass on the planet that is made up of part of a tectonic plate. There are seven continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, North America, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. Long before scientists knew about Earth's tectonic plates, Map makers had noticed that the continents looked like they could fit together like puzzle pieces. Scientists now know that the reason the continents look like they fit together is that at one point they had. The completed puzzle formed Pangaea, the ancient supercontinent that was home to the dinosaurs. The explanation for how land masses as large as the continents could move apart is that the continents are part of the tectonic plates which are pushed and pulled by the movement of the magma beneath them. Over time, the plates shifted, causing the continents to separate into the shapes we have today. Cycling of Earth's materials. Sometimes the movement of the tectonic plates causes vents to open up in Earth's crust. The vents allow magma from the mantle to seep through, forming volcanoes. The vents that allow magma to escape and form volcanoes are typically found on the edges of moving tectonic plates. Volcanoes also form on the ocean floor where the crust is thinner and so can crack more easily. Volcanoes produce the newest land on Earth. The islands of Hawaii were built up from volcanoes on the ocean's floor that erupted and cooled to form habitable land. When volcanic eruptions reach Earth's surface, they bring with them mounds of volcanic material that eventually cool and harden into a kind of rock called igneous rock. <clears throat> the word igneous means from fire. Igneous rocks form when magma or lava from Earth's mantle cools into solid form. This kind of rock is what Dr. Keller focuses on. <clears throat> In addition to igneous rock, there are two other categories of rock, metamorphic rock and sedimentary rock. Metamorphic rocks are rocks formed in chemical reactions where one type of rock is changed by pressure or heat into a new type of rock with different properties. The movement of Earth's tectonic plates can cause rocks to get pushed down deep into the crust. There, the heat and pressure of all the weight on top of them cause the chemical reactions. 
Sedimentary rocks are formed from layers of sand, soil, clay, gravel, and other sediment that builds up in one location over time. The pieces of sediment are carried by the wind and rain to settle on the ground or in the lakes and oceans. Over thousands or millions of years, the pressure of more and more layers of sediment compresses the layers of sediment into solid rock. Because of this, the oldest sediment forms the bottom most layers of the rock. Newer layers replace older layers at the top. Rocks are always changing. The changes often happen slowly over thousands or millions of years, but nearly all of the crust that you see today will someday be returned to Earth's mantle. All of the rocks that are on Earth today are made of the same matter that existed when dinosaurs roamed. But the matter is reshaped and reformed over millions of years into new rocks with different properties. For example, rocks break down into sediment. That sediment can collect in layers. Over time, heat and pressure can compress the layers of sediment into new sedimentary rock. Or tectonic plates can push the sediment deep into Earth's crust. There, it can undergo chemical reactions that change its properties, turning it into metamorphic rock. Eventually, any rock pushed deep into Earth's interior will melt into magma. If magma reaches the surface, it will cool and harden into rocks again. All rocks on Earth's surface are weathered and eroded. The processes that form, break down, and reform rock from one category to another are called the rock cycle. Section three, Earth's geologic record, whale fossils on a mountaintop. In 1987, a team of scientists hiked through the Andes Mountains more than 1,524 meters or 5,000 feet above sea level. They were on a mission to find fossils of whales and other marine organisms to bring back to a museum to study. Fossils are the remains of ancient animals and plants the traces or impressions of living things from past geologic ages, or the traces of their activities. Sedimentary rock often holds fossils because its layers built up over time. As sediment was deposited, it often traps and preserved remains of living things. These remains include whole plants and animals, as well as traces of organisms, such as footprints. Fossils can tell scientists a lot about Earth's past, including what the environment was like and how it changed. For example, the whale fossils told scientists that the land was once covered by an ocean because whales can only survive in the ocean. The marine fossils on top of the mountain also told scientists about a major change to Earth's surface. They are evidence that the mountain used to be much lower because it was once covered in water. At some point, two tectonic plates collided, pushing the land upward and forming the mountain. Geologic detective work. Geologists are like detectives. They look for clues in the layers of rock that tell them how Earth has changed since it first formed 4.6 billion years ago. For example, the geologists who traveled to the Andes learned a lot of information from the fossils they found. They gathered fossils from a 305 meter or 1,000 foot thick rock section of one of the mountains. Within their rock sample, they found fossils of both marine and land animal in different layers. They found oyster beds and sand dollars, which were both evidence of a marine environment. Right above these layers were fossils of land organisms. Understanding layers is an important part of this geologic detective work. The rock layers and the fossils found in them are called geologic columns. Geologists refer to the rock strata when talking about the layered arrangements of rock in the geologic column. Scientists know that when they look at rock strata, the bottom layer is generally the oldest layer. The top layer is the newest, most recent layer. This is because of the process of sedimentation. Sediment formed by weathering and erosion slowly accumulates in layers in oceans, lakes, and valleys over time. Each new layer is deposited on top of an older layer. 
this process also results in layers that are horizontal. In other words, the layers are parallel or mostly parallel, parallel to Earth's surface. The layers of rock and fossils in the geologic column told the geologists in the Andes that the land was once covered by an ocean. It then transitioned to a land environment, which scientists believe happened as tectonic plates pushed the land upward, causing the ocean to disappear. Piecing together the clues. When geologists look at different rock strata, they can often reconstruct the sequence of many of the events that have shaped Earth's surface. They often begin by correlating the rock layers from different locations. In geology, correlation is the matching up of rock layers from one location to another. Correlation can be done by comparing rock layers from one region with rock layers from another region. Scientists look for similarities in the appearance of the rock layer, how thick the layer is, the color of the layer, and the order in which the layers appear, their sequence. Looking for similarities is not always entirely accurate, however. This is because similar rocks sometimes appear in layers that are millions of years apart. Key beds can sometimes help geologists correlate rock layers more accurately. A key bed is a distinct layer of rock that formed over a large area in a very brief amount of time. For example, if a volcano erupted and spewed ash across a large part of the region, that ash will settle on the ground and mix with the other sediment. Geologists can use the presence of ash to help them correlate rock layers more accurately. The presence of igneous rock also tells geologists that a volcanic eruption likely occurred. Remember that igneous rock forms when magma or lava from Earth's mantle cools into solid form. Index fossils can also help scientists correlate different rock layers. Index fossils are certain fossils known to exist in a particular time and place that may be used to determine the relative age of rocks or other fossils. Scientists have numeric ages for index fossils. These fossils may be used to determine the relative age of rocks or other fossils. Because of this, they are sometimes called guide fossils. There are three criteria that a fossil must meet to be considered an index fossil. One, it must be easy to identify. This means it must look unique so that it cannot be confused for another kind of fossil. Two, it must be found over a large area of land. This is so that it can be used to correlate rock layers that are separated by large distances. Three, the organism must have only lived for a short period in time that way, it will only show up in a single rock layer. This makes it easier to identify rock strata from different time periods. Even with all of these clues, it can be difficult to correlate rock layers. This is because Earth's surface is dynamic and constantly changing. Remember that weathering and erosion act on all Earth materials on Earth's surface. Sometimes one layer of rock can be eroded in one location, but it isn't eroded in the rock strata from another location. In addition, events such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountain building can cause rock formations to change. Geologists have, a piece together, have to piece together what they know about Earth's processes and how the rock strata form to help them correlate rock layers that don't match up perfectly. One way to do this is to compare the geologic column from multiple locations. This increases the chances that index fossils will be found among different locations and that missing rock layers and strata from one location will be present in the rock strata from a different location. Geologic time scales. Using the layers of a rock sample can help geologists determine the relative age of different rocks and fossils. Relative age tells scientists whether something is younger or older than something else. It is not a specific age of something. Numeric age is a precise number in years, minutes, or other unit of time that represents how much time has passed. For example, Earth is 4.6 billion years old. This is a numeric age, not a relative age. Scientists use a method called radiometric dating to determine the numeric age of a rock or fossil. This method is very complicated, but essentially it measures the radioactive decay of a different elements 
within a rock or fossil to measure its numeric age. The geologists in the Andes studied the geologic column from that area to determine the relative age of the fossils. For example, the whale fossils were in a layer of rock below the layers of sediment containing land animal fossils. This sequence of layers provided the geologists with a relative, not a numeric age. It told the scientists the whale fossils were older than the land animal fossils, not specifically how old the whale fossils were. There are other clues that can help scientists determine the relative age of different rocks. Sometimes one kind of rock cuts into the existing rock strata. When this happens, scientists know that the rock cutting into the layers is newer than the layers of rock themselves. Geologists can also use the geologic time scale to help them determine the age of new discoveries. Years of carefully studying rock strata from all over the planet have allowed geologists to find patterns in the geologic column so they can correlate rock layers and break them down into units of known relative age. Geologists use different units of time to do this, including eons, eras, periods, and years. Eons are the one of the longest units of time, and they are divided into eras. Eras represent different stages in the fossil record, which is made up of all of the fossils that have ever been found. Scientists use the fossil record to understand Earth's history. Eras are shorter than eons, but they are still long. Eras are divided into periods. A period is the basic unit within the geologic time scale. Wow, I learned a lot reading landforms. I hope that you learned a lot too. I'll see you tomorrow with another book. Bye.